Section 9, Cause of Solar and Lunar Eclipses. An eclipse of the sun is caused simply by the moon passing before it, or between it and the observer on the earth. Of this, no question has been raised, but that an eclipse of the moon arises from a shadow of the earth is in every respect unsatisfactory. The earth has been proved to have no motion, either upon axis or in an orbit around the sun, and therefore it could never come between the sun and the moon. The earth is proved to be a plane always underneath the sun and moon, and therefore to speak of its intercepting the light of the sun and thus casting its own shadow upon the moon is to say that which is impossible. Besides this, cases are on record of the sun and eclipsed moon being above the horizon altogether. Quote, the full moon has sometimes been seen above the horizon before the sun was set. A remarkable instance of this kind was observed at Paris on the 19th of July, 1750, when the moon appeared visibly eclipsed while the sun was distinctly to be seen above the horizon. End quote. Quote, on the 20th of April, 1837, the moon appeared to rise eclipsed before the sun had set. The same phenomenon was observed on the 20th of September, 1717, end quote. Quote, in the lunar eclipses of July 17th, 1590, November 3rd, 1648, June 16th, 1666, and May 26th, 1668, the moon rose eclipsed whilst the sun was still apparently above the horizon. These horizontal eclipses were noticed as early as the time of Pliny, end quote. The moon's entire surface, or that portion presented to the earth, has also been distinctly seen during the whole time of a total eclipse, a phenomenon in utterly incompatible with the doctrine that the earth's shadow is the cause of it. Quote, the moon has sometimes shown during a total eclipse with an almost unaccountable distinctness on December 22, 1703, the moon, when totally immersed in the earth's shadow, was visible at Avignon by a ruddy light of such brilliancy that one might have imagined her body to be transparent and to the enlightened from behind. On March 19, 1848, the above quotes were uh, Ast Astronomy and Astronomical Instruments, page 105, by G.O.G. Carey, also McCulloch's Geography, page 85, and Illustrated London Almanac for 1864 the astronomical part in which is by James Glacier, Esquire of the Greenwich Observatory. And so, on March 19, 1848, it is stated that so bright was the moon's surface during its total immersion that many persons could not be persuaded that it was eclipsed. Mr. Forster of Bruges states in an account of that eclipse that the light and dark places on the moon's surface could almost be well made out as an ordinary dull moonlit night. Quote, sometimes in a total lunar eclipse, the moon will appear quite obscure in some parts of its surface, and in other parts will exhibit a high degree of illumination. To a certain extent, I witnessed some of these phenomena during the merely partial eclipse of February 7th, 1860. Returning to quote, I prepared during the afternoon of February 6th for witnessing the eclipse without any distinct expectation of seeing much worthy of note. I knew, however, that upwards of eight-tenths of the disk would be covered, and I was anxious to observe with what degree of distinctness the eclipsed portion could be viewed, partly as an interesting fact, and partly with a view of verifying or discovering the weak points of an engraving, in which I am concerned, of a lunar eclipse. Quote, after seeing the increased darkness of the penumbra softly merging into the true shadow at the commencement of the eclipse, about 1 o'clock a.m. Greenwich time, I proceeded with pencil and paper, dimly lighted by a distant lamp, to note by name the different lunar mountains and plains, the so-called seas, over which the shadow passed. During the first hour and ten minutes, I had seen nothing unexpected. I had repeatedly written down my observations of the remarkable clearness with which the moon's eclipsed outline could be seen, both with the naked eye and with the telescope. At one hour fifty-eight minutes, however, I suddenly noted the ruddy color of a portion of the moon. I may well have 
give my notes in the original words as copied next day in a more connected form. One hour, 58 minutes, Greenwich time. I am suddenly struck by the fact that the whole of the western seas of the moon are showing through the shadow with singular sharpness, and that the whole region where they lie has assumed a decidedly reddish tinge, attaining its greatest brightness at a sort of temporary polar region, having Edmayan about the position of its imaginary pole. I particularly notice the lake of sleep has disappeared in this brightness instead of standing out in darker shade. And I notice that this so-called polar region is not parallel with the rim of the shadow, but is rather west of it. Two hours, 15 minutes, some clouds through very thin and transparent now intervene. Two hours, 20 minutes, the sky is now cleared. How extraordinary is the appearance of the moon? Reddish is not the word to express it. It is red and red hot. I endeavor to think of various red objects with which to compare it, and nothing seems so like as red-hot penny. A red-hot penny with a little white-hot piece at its lower edge standing out against the dark blue background. Only it is evidently not a mere disc, but beautifully rounded by shading. Quote, Such is its appearance with the naked eye. With the telescope, its surface varies more in tint than with the naked eye, and is of not quite so bright red as when thus viewed. The redness continues to be most perceptible at a distance from the shadow's southern edge, and to be greatest about the region of Endymion. The Hercynian Mountains, north of Grimaldus, are, however, of rather a bright red, and Grimaldus shows well. Merichrysium and the western seas are wonderfully distinct, not a trace to be seen of Aristarchus or Plato. Two hours, 27 minutes, it is now nearly the middle of the eclipse. The red color is very brilliant to the naked eye. After this, I noticed a progressive change of tint in the moon, two hours, 50 minutes. The moon does not seem to the naked eye of so bright a red as before. And I again am reminded by its tint of red-hot copper, or rather copper which has begun to cool. The whole Grimaldi is now uncovered. Through the telescope, I noticed a decided gray shade at the lower part of the eclipsed portion. And the various small craters give it a stippled effect, like the old aquatint engravings. The upper part is reddish, but two graceful bluish curves like horns mark the form of the Hercynian Mountains and the bright region on the other limb of the moon. These are visible also to the naked eye. Quote, at three hours five minutes, the redness had almost disappeared. A very few minutes afterwards, no trace of it remained. Long clouds came on. I watched the moon, however, occasionally gaining a glimpse of its disk, still a quarter to four o'clock, when, for the last time on that occasion, I saw it faintly appearing through the clouds, nearly a full moon again. And then I took leave of it, feeling amply repaid for my vigil by the beautiful spectacle which I had seen." End quote. Mr. Walkie, who observed the lunar eclipse of March 19, 1848, near Columption, says, quote, The appearances were, as usual, till twenty minutes past nine, at that period, and for the space of the next hour, instead of an eclipse or the shadow or umbra of the earth being ca the cause of the total obscurity of the moon, the whole phase of that body became very quickly and most beautifully, the previous quotes were from the Honorable Mrs. Ward, Trimbleston House near Dublin in Recreative Science, page 281. The whole phase of that body became very quickly and most beautifully illuminated, and assumed in the appearance of the glowing heat of fire from the furnace rather tinged with a deep red. The whole disk of the moon being as perfect with light as if there had been no eclipse whatever. The moon positively gave good light from its disk during the total eclipse." End quote. In the astronomical portion of the quote, illustrated London Almanac for 1864 end quote, by Mr. Glacier, a beautiful tinted engraving is given representing the appearance of the moon during the total eclipse of June 1st, 1863, when all the light and dark places, the so-called mountains, seas, etc., were plainly visible. In the accompanying descriptive chapter, the following sentences occur. Quote, 
At the time of totality, the moon presented a soft woolly appearance, apparently more globular in form than when fully illuminated. Traces of the larger and brighter mountains were visible at the time of totality, and particularly the bright rays proceeding from the Tycho, Kepler, and Aristarchus. At first, when the obscured part was of small dimensions, it was of an iron-gray tint, but as it approached totality, the reddish light became so apparent that it was remarked that the moon seemed to be on fire, and when the totality had commenced, it certainly looked like a fire. Previous quotes from Philosophical Magazine, number 220, for August of 1848. Certainly looked like a fire smoldering in its ashes and almost going out, end quote. If then, the sun and moon have many times been seen over the horizon when the latter was eclipsed, so how can it be said that the Earth's shadow was the cause of a lunar eclipse when the Earth was not between or in line with the sun and moon? And how can the moon's non-luminous surface be distinctly visible and illuminated during the very totality of an eclipse if all the light of the sun is intercepted by the Earth? Question mark. Again, if the moon is a sphere, which it is declared to be, how can its surface reflect the light of the sun? If her surface was a mass of polished silver, it could not reflect from more than a mere point. Let a silvered glass ball or a globe of considerable size be held before a lamp of fire or any magnitude, it will be seen that instead of the whole surface reflecting light, there will be a very small portion only illuminated. But the moon's whole surface is brilliantly illuminated, a condition or effect utterly impossible if it be spherical. The surface might be illuminated from the sun or any other source of, if opaque, instead of polished like an ordinary silvered mirror, but it could not shine intensively from every part of it and brightly illuminate the objects before it, as the moon does so beautifully when full and in clear firmament. If the earth were admitted to be globular and to move and to be capable of throwing a shadow by intercepting the light of the sun, it would be impossible for a lunar eclipse to occur thereby unless at the same time the moon be proved to be non-luminous and to shine only by reflection. But this is not proved. It is only assumed as an essential part of a theory. The contrary is capable of proof, and proof beyond the power of doubt, visually, that the moon is self-luminous or shines with a light peculiar to herself, and therefore independently of the sun. A reflector necessarily gives off what it receives. If a mass of red-hot metal be placed before a plane or a concave surface, heat will be reflected. If snow or ice be similarly placed, cold will be reflected. If light or ordinary colored be presented, the same will be reflected. If sound of a given pitch be produced, the same pitch will be reflected. If the note A can be sounded upon a musical instrument, a reflector would not turn the note B or C, but the same note, altered only in degree or intensity, but not in pitch. A reflector receiving a red light would not return a blue or yellow light. A reflector collecting the cold uh, from a mass of ice would not throw off heat, nor the contrary. Nor could the moon, if a reflector, radiate or throw down upon the earth any other lights than such she receives from the sun. No difference could exist in the quality or character of the light, and it could differ in no respect but the quantity or intensity. The light of the sun and of the moon are different in their general appearance, in the color and action upon the eye. The sun's light is drying and preservative, or antiseptic. The moon's light is damp and putrefective. The sun's rays will put out a common fire. The moon's light will increase the combustion. The light of the sun falling upon certain chemical substances produces a change of color as in photographic and other processes. The light of the moon fails to produce the same effect. Dr. Lardner, at page 121 of his excellent work, quote, The Museum of Science, end quote, says, quote, The most striking instance of the effect of certain rays of solar light in blackening a light-colored substance is afforded by chloride or silver.
which is a white substance, but which immediately becomes black when acted upon by the rays near the violet extremity of the spectrum. This substance, however, highly susceptible as it is of having its color affected by light, is nevertheless found not to be changed in any sensible degree when exposed to the light of the moon, even when that light is condensed by the most powerful burning lenses." End quote. The sun's light, when concentrated by a number of mirrors or a large burning lens, produces a focus which is entirely non-luminous, but in which the heat is so great that metallic and alkaline substances are quickly fused. Earthy and mineral compounds almost immediately vitrified, and all animal and vegetable structures in a few seconds burned up and destroyed. But the moon's light is so concentrated, produces a brilliant focus, so luminous that it's difficult to look upon it, and yet there is no increase of temperature. Quote, if the most delicate thermometer be exposed to the full light of the moon, shining with its greatest luster, the mercury is not elevated a hair's breadth. Neither would it be if exposed to the focus of her rays concentrated by the most powerful lenses. This has been proved by actual experiment. End quote. Quote, this question has been submitted to the test of direct experiment. The bulb of a thermometer is sufficiently sensitive to render apparent change of temperature amounting to the thousandth part of a degree was placed in the focus of a concave reflector of vast dimensions, which being directed to the moon, the lunar rays were collected with great power upon it. These quotes are from All the Year Round by Dickens. Not the slightest change, however, was produced in the thermometric column, proving that a concentration of rays sufficient to fuse gold if they proceeded from the sun does not produce a change of temperature so great as the thousandth part of a degree when they proceed from the moon. End quote. Quote, the light from the moon, though concentrated by the most powerful burning lens available at the time, is incapable of raising the temperature of the most delicate thermometer. M. D. La Hire collected the rays of the full moon when on the meridian by means of burning glass 35 inches in diameter and made them fall on the bulb of a delicate air thermometer. No effect was produced though the lunar rays by this glass were concentrated 300 times. End quote. Quote, Professor Forbes concentrated the moon's light by a lens 30 inches in diameter, its focal distance being about 41 inches, and having a power of concentration exceeding 6,000 times. The image of the moon, which was only 18 hours past full, and less than two hours from the meridian, was brilliantly thrown by this lens on the extremity of a commodious thermopile. Although the observations were made in the most unexceptional manner, and supposing that half the rays were reflected, dispersed, and absorbed, though the light of the moon was concentrated, this quote is from Dr. Lardner's Museum of Science, page 115, Though the light of the moon was concentrated 3,000 times, not the slightest thermo effect was produced. In the so-called Lancet, or Medical Journal, for March 14, 1856, particulars are given of several experiments which proved that the moon's rays, when concentrated, actually reduced the temperature upon a thermometer more than 8 degrees. Quote, the cold, chaste moon, the queen of heaven, bright Isles, who makes all beautiful, on which she smiles, that wandering shrine of soft yet icy flame, which ever is transformed, yet still the same, and warms but not illumes. Shelley. The so-called pale cold moon is an expression not only beautifully poetic, but evidently true philosophically. If, as we have now seen, the very nature of a reflector demands certain conditions, and the moon does not manifest these conditions, it must of necessity be concluded that the moon is not a reflector, but a self-luminous body. If self-luminous, her surface could not be darkened or eclipsed by a shadow of the earth. 
Supposing such were thrown upon it, the luminosity, instead of being diminished, would be greater in proportion to the greater density, or, previous quotes from Dr. Noad's lectures on chemistry, page 334, greater in proportion to the greater density, or darkness, of the shadow. As the light in a lantern shines most brightly in the darkest places, so would the moon's self-luminous surface be most intense in the deepest part of the Earth's shadow. It is thus rendered undeniable that a lunar eclipse does not and could not arise from a shadow of the Earth. As a solar eclipse occurs from the moon passing over the sun, so, from the evidence, it is clear that a lunar eclipse can only arise from a similar cause, a body semi-transparent and well-defined passing before the moon or between her surface and the observer on the surface of the earth. That such a body exists is admitted by several distinguished astronomers. In the report of the Council of the Royal Astronomical Society for June 1850, it is stated, Quote, we may well doubt whether that a body which we call the moon is the only satellite of the earth, end quote. In the report of the Academy of Sciences for October 12, 1846, and again for August 1847, the director of one of the French observatories gives a number of observations and calculations which have led him to conclude that, quote, there is at least one non-luminous body of considerable magnitude which is attached as a satellite to this Earth, end quote. Persons who are unacquainted with the methods of calculating eclipses and other, for said quote, referred to in Lardner's, quote, Museum of Science, page 159, persons who are unacquainted with the methods of calculating eclipses and other astronomical phenomena are prone to look upon the correctness of these calculations as powerful arguments in favor of the doctrine of the Earth's rotundity and the Newtonian philosophy, generally speaking. But this is erroneous. Whatever theory is adopted, or if all theories are discarded, the same results may follow because the necessary data may be tabulated and employed independently of all theory, or may be mixed up with any even the most opposite doctrines or kept distinct from every system, just as the operator may decide. The tables of the moon's relative positions for almost any second of the time are purely practical, the result of long-continued observation, and may or may not be mixed up with the hypothesis. In Smith's, quote, rise and progress of astronomy, end quote, speaking of Ptolemy, who lived in the second century of the Christian era, it is said, quote, the considered defects of his system did not prevent him from calculating all the eclipses that were to happen from 600 years to come, end quote. Professor Partington, at page 370 of his lectures on natural philosophy, says, quote, the most ancient observations of which we are in possession that are sufficiently accurate to be employed in astronomical calculations are those made at Babylon about 719 years before the Christian era. Of three eclipses of the moon, Ptolemy, who has transmitted them to us, employed them for determining the period of the moon's mean motion and therefore had probably none more ancient on which he could depend. The Chaldeans, however, must have made a long series of observations before they could discover their Saros, or lunar period, of 6,585 and one-third days, or about 18 years, at which time, as they had learnt, the place of the moon, her node and apogee, return nearly to the same situation with respect to the earth and sun, and, of course, a series of nearly similar eclipses occur, end quote. Sir Richard Phillips, at the, in his, quote, millions of facts, at page 388, says, quote, The procession of astronomy arises not from theories, but from prolonged observations, and the regularity of the motions, or the ascertained uniformity of their irregularities. Ephemerides of the planets, places, of eclipses, etc., 
have been published for over 300 years and were nearly as precise as at present, end quote. Quote, these are coming from Somerville's Physical Sciences, page 46, quote, no particular theory is required to calculate the eclipses and the calculations may be made with equal accuracy independent of every theory, end quote. End of section nine. Thanks so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video presentation. If you did, please subscribe to my YouTube channel, like the video, and share it on your favorite social media sites. There's a lot more to come, so stay tuned, and we'll see you back next time.